Hello and welcome, I'm JD and this is the Missile Mixing Update for Nebulous Fleet Command. So the main feature here is the ability to mix salvos uh, when firing missiles. So let's have a look at this feature. So first of all, uh, in single player campaign tutorials under the Missile School, we now have the mixed missile salvo um, tutorial, which is lesson three. It is uh, about five to eight minutes long, uh, pretty quick and to the point. So I recommend uh, going through this. However, we'll also have a look at the functionality in the testing range. Okay, so here we are in the testing range. We have our light cruiser, which has a number of different VLS systems. So the VLS twos, threes, and ones. Um, this will also work for container uh, modules for the OSP and any of the, um, and for the SLO, which is able to equip the vertical launch systems as well. Uh, it doesn't work with the MLS, uh, just for a little bit of a differentiation. So you can access the feature by uh, right-clicking on a track to fire it in the track position or right clicking into empty space to fire it positionally. Either way, um, it'll open up the weapons menu and you'll see all the missiles that are currently equipped onto uh, that ship. Now you can utilize this feature in a formation, but each formation will need to have the exact same missiles in order to fire the salvos. So here you can see that I have size two missiles, uh, some with support modules, uh, some with just radar guidance. As a standard Thunderhead, we've got some size three hybrids and we've also got some size ones, all in uh, offensive roles. So now what you can do is you can create a salvo. So you create a salvo by adding uh, at least one missile into the salvo. So to add missiles to a salvo, you use the plus feature. And then to remove a missile from a salvo, you press the minus. Now the order that you do select the missiles in is the order that they will be um, dispensed from the ship towards the target. As you can see, I've gone from top to bottom twice, and it is in that order. Now if you do subtract, it will just remove the bottom one. And so this allows you to create salvos that have a support module at the beginning, for example. There may be a number of missiles in between, and you can add a few others in, maybe add some support modules at the end. And that's something that is described within the uh, advanced tutorial. The limiting factor of a salvo is how many channels you have. This ship has 11 channels. So it'll be able to use, uh, fire up to 11 missiles at once. And as we add more missiles, you can see that now all 11 channels are used and it will also tell us that we can fire this particular salvo six times based on the current amount of missiles on this ship. So to fire the salvo, all you now need to do is press launch mix salvo. You can fire it wherever you wish. Uh, I'm not going to fire it at the uh, targets because I don't want them to actually um, be destroyed and end this testing range. So as we fire, you'll see that they'll all start to program. Once they are programmed and we are waiting for them all to finish, they will then all launch at the same time. So all your um, missiles will wait to fire together and then they'll, they'll launch. You will note that they are traveling at different ranges and different speeds. Um, one thing that you do need to consider when you are using this feature is make sure that the speeds um, are either about the same if you want them to land at the same time or if you want one to particularly go ahead, maybe it's a support module, it's designed to have decoys, uh, it's designed to um, soak up the point defense uh, of the enemy. You want to make sure that one travels faster than say perhaps um, your damage deal, which maybe you want a little bit slower. So it gets there last. Um, also range, if you're firing something at 12 kilometers and something at three and you put them all into a salvo together, it's actually going to make it a little bit harder um, than what's going to occur is obviously some will be able to make it out towards that max range and some will just uh, harmlessly explode. So make sure you're taking that consideration into firing. You should still get the warnings for uh, range if you are um, firing too far or you start to position too far out. If you want to refire that salvo, you right click again, either on the track or into the space and you can click and fire again. If you do want to have a different salvo configuration, just come into weapons. Instead of having to uh, remove them all, just select your new configuration. That's going to overwrite the bottom one. There's also now a change to the icons that will appear on a missile. So I'll just fire a single thunderhead here. As it comes out, you'll see that there is a green icon. So it's just launching. And once it actually gets to its final waypoint, which we put here, you'll see that the icon now changes uh, to effectively like this windscreen wiper, uh, which is effectively showing. Um, if you've ever seen the old movies with radar, it's like that radar pass. It's looking for a target. You can see here that the seeker is activated because the cone is being drawn onto the uh, tactical view of the map. And what we'll see now is if I just unpause it or return it to normal speed, once this finds its target, so this cone enters one of these uh, or touches these ships, it'll change from a seeking down to a lock. So here you can see that the seek 
So here you can see that the symbol has now changed to a green target. That's confirming that this seeker has now locked onto this target. If this ship here was to uh, deploy countermeasures, which there are none, and it was to, um, or it was to get jammed or something like that, you'll see this icon change appropriately. Uh, you can see there that it found the better target. Instead of selecting this first one uh, where the orange line was drawn, it's now gone off to the second target here. So it's identified the better track. Uh, and just back to the radar thing, if it does get jammed, you'll see that there is a red uh, jamming icon there. So you can see it switching. Now you can see, um, so this is a really good opportunity to see how seekers interact uh, with ships in testing ranges so that when you have things like primary, secondaries, validations, etc., you know exactly what that um, seeker is doing and you understand a little bit more about how this is all working together within the game. So there's a new mount for the Alliance to add to their repertoire. So this is the TLS or the turreted launch system. Um, it functions in a similar way to the VLS or the CLS, the vertical or the uh, canted. Um, so this is for size threes. You can equip size three hybrids and you can also equip uh, mace torpedoes, which have had a bit of a buff. Um, it does now allow for this to turn around. If I just select the ship and we can set um, the ability to fire just off to the side like that. You can see that we'll now be able to uh, turn around. It rotates pretty quickly. There are no buffing modules on this um, and it should do a hot launch here at some point. It's just programming the one missile even though it's not showing it down there for some reason. And we'll just wait, there we go, and off it goes. So if you've set these to hot launch, uh, it's probably gonna be a lot better as they fire out of the tubes. Uh, this one here, I think I've set to cold launch for some reason uh, as part of this test. So I think drive-bys uh, in particular in particular, will be a, something that these are really good for. I think the fact that you can uh, get them out of the tubes quicker and then towards the enemy as, a, as opposed to like if you're cold launching and then they come up and give the op option for the enemy point defense network to engage and destroy them. What you previously used to happen uh, if you were close in, particularly towards the later stages of the game, is that you would end up actually missing because you didn't have enough maneuverability. So I think this will address that simply because um, you can now have these in your, um, your backpacks, on your light cruisers, on your frigates, for example, like that. And you can get nice and close and just fire this straight into the enemy uh, or to the side of the enemy instead of having to wait for it to come up and around and then potentially miss. One change that has uh, been uh, introduced now and I think is a great change, everyone will like, really like this one, uh, is the change to the anti-missile missiles and how they now work. So previously, Center. if uh, we had a missile coming in from the fleet out um, to the front of us, then each of these ships here would now be launching one anti-missile missile, missile uh, in order to respond to that threat because that's the way that they've been set up. So what we have wanted is the ability for, if there's only one missile coming in, not to fire from both the ANZ range and the ANZ hash of Keddy, but actually just fire one missile from between the two of them to intercept with that. So let's have a look now. I'll just fire a simple um, signs one missile here. That's gonna program. And what will happen is only one missile will actually be um, sent from one of these ships and engage that. Break, break. Spiker inbound. There you go. A single missile uh, has now engaged. And as you can see, oh, it doesn't intercept. It just out harmlessly explodes. Um, but you get the point. So what that means now for you is that you shouldn't be wasting a whole bunch of these missiles. Um, if you bring 46 on the hash of Keddy and the uh, 46 on the ANZ range, then you're going to have a lot of AMMs now to utilize. However, um, you're not going to dump them all in response to the first salvo uh, from the enemy. So the final thing I want to talk about here in terms of uh, changes to the AMMs is the way that they actually uh, now do damage. So previously, AMMs were based on, um, the damage was based on velocity, whereas now it depends on angle. So, for example, in a head-on situation like this, then this anti-missile missile will actually do more damage to this torpedo based on the fact that it's a head-on, or if there was an AMM that was, for some reason, that approach from behind, it would also do more damage. If it now becomes uh, perpendicular, so if you get an uh, AMM that comes through and hits the torpedo on the side or another missile on the side, it's going to do less damage. 
Again, this is a nice little change um, just as it allows you to not have to worry so much about the speed of um, your AMMs and you can actually start to tailor them more for range uh, as well as maneuverability. And that's really where you're gonna to wanna to aim this now because those AMMs are going to be able to um, guide themselves in through that direct angle, which is generally what they're set at, uh, and to come on head on into the torpedo, which will then do more damage. So this will enable you to have um, more use out of your AMMs. It'll also enable you to have more of a greater chance to intercept them at a, a longer range, uh, and then allow on your PED or point defense network uh, internally to then um, get through and deal with any of the, the loose stragglers. All right, so a new Intel state has now been added. So here you can see that I've destroyed a light cruiser. You can see that under Intel, it says not under command. So that's standard. Um, you can tell that the ship is destroyed because we have the uh, smoke clouds which have appeared in any, any second now you'll start to see the life pods being ejected there you go so that's the second indicator and if you are nice and close you may even hear the buzzer which also figures uh, or identifies that uh, that ship has now been um, destroyed now previously this was these were the three uh, only options to identify a downed ship or a destroyed ship um, can be a little bit hard, particularly in a close in environment where uh, some of these ships, if they're still underway, this was this one was stationary when it was destroyed, uh, will keep going and you can't tell um, the ship may end up here, but the smoke will end up here. Or as you can see, as I rotate around, um, once the life pods have gone, you can't actually see that uh, smoke cloud or that oil cloud or um, all the debris from the ship to identify that it's destroyed because of how it's um, playing within regards to the background. So the Intel will now give you a new status. And if I just speed time up just ever so slightly, so we get the next update. So I've got an Intel Center on Talon, I think. So you should get an Intel update every 30 seconds um, with the uh, Intel Center. You can, see, you can see that it now says evacuated. If I just move my mouse a little bit or scroll out, you can see there that it says evacuated. So now uh, Intel, regardless of whether I have an Intel center that's updating every 30 seconds or you have just a CIC, which is you know giving you something every minute, 90 seconds or something like that. As the battle progresses, you don't need to look for these little icons, uh, particularly if you're the type of player who uh, plays more out in the TAC map like this. You're not gonna be able to see those icons um, or, those dis uh, or those identifiers that something is destroyed. So now you'll be able to just see evacuated, you'll be able to come in, you'll be able to mark it as killed and you'll be able to move on with the battle because all other symbols um, will disappear and you don't have to come in here and get nice and close to look at the ship. Is it destroyed? What is it Windows doing, et cetera, like that. So a nice little change. It makes Intel, again, another little thing that you can use to uh, make informed decisions on, noting obviously that there is always the condition um, and PD inaccuracies and, e and even in the States, uh, such as not under command or immobilized, they can come back. You, there's no coming back from evacuated. So um, you do know that this is probably the most constant piece of intel that you'll ever get. All right, so the E15 Masquerade Deception module has had a bit of a rework. Previously, it just reduced the signature size for memory. Um, however, it now allows you to actually change uh, how the intelligence is identified on that ship until it is identified through visual means. So we can have a look here by presenting a deceptive signature, the module can fill enemy intel, um, effectively making a sprinter look like a Solomon. Note the signature modification can also work down the size hierarchy. So you can have a Solomon look like a sprinter and a sprinter look like a Solomon, but the masquerade is unable to reduce radar signature size and you'll be able to notice through a discrepancy in detection ranges. So what is that saying? Well, it's saying that on this light cruiser, I can have a, um, I can have this appear on the Intel as a sprinter as part of those initial uh, updates or a, a Solomon, or I can even have it as a destroyer or something else. Uh, however, my radar signature size isn't gonna change. So those savvy commanders will be able to identify how fast a ship is normally moving. Um, so if something's moving at 40 meters per second, chances are it's not a battleship and you'll also be able to determine based on detection ranges. So if you have a Solomon and you're saying that it's a sprinter, then, um, and you're appearing at the maximum effective range of a radar, which heavy cruisers and battleships are generally identified at, chances are you're not going to be able to, um, chances are that's not gonna be that sprinter. So when you are using the deception modules, you do need to be aware of what you're um, saying it looks as, and then how you're actually playing with that ship. So sometimes it's, it might be worth actually saying, you know, that this light cruiser is a heavy cruiser because it's more believable that a heavy cruiser could be going slow enough for a light cruiser, or you could have a couple frigates 
that are just going fairly slow, maybe two thirds of speed to uh, appear as Axford over on one side of the map. Um, so it looks like that you're concentrating your force over there. In actual fact, all your Axfords are on the other side, opposing as reins. So you can always do something like that. Just play, be aware of how they play. One thing to note, uh, now I've got three deception modules onto this ship. Now you don't activate these, they are always active. Um, and you can effectively really only be one. So here, even though I've got three, I'm actually wasting two because um, the way the game picks this up, it's going to look for this first masquerade and say that's what it is for the game. So when we go in and show the demo, it's going to appear as a sprinter. I'm effectively wasting the points, the energy, and the, mo the mount slots uh, for these other two modules. So just be aware of that when you're designing it. Just, just put one deception module uh, per ship and no more than that. All right, so we're in here now that you can see that, that this ship here has the deception module. Uh, and if we just have a look a little bit uh, over here, it's track 5589, which is actually going to be uh, the one that has the deception module for the enemy. So, so we know that these are both light cruisers because I've loaded in the mirror fleet. These are both uh, Talon and Tooth over on the opposing side. And we can see that they're both warships. Uh, if we just speed up time, oh no, we don't need to. So there you go. That first packet is being shown that the warship is identified as a Corvette. Uh, if we just keep going like that, the Intel should change um, the Corvette to a Sprinter. There we go. So even though these are both like cruisers, we know uh, we've been told that the information on uh, one of them is that there's a Corvette and a Sprinter and a light cruiser and a Voxel. So how do you get through the deception methods? Well, the only way to actually do it is uh, not through intelligence, but actually driving your ship close enough to be identified um, or to visually identify the enemy. So if we speed up time, we're just going to drive the light cruiser forward. Note, here we go. You can see that this here says it's uh, OSP Talon. And as we get within visual range, and we are now within visual range, you can see that it now changes to Voxel. Um, and that's now the light cruiser. So for the rest of this game, even if I was to now stop, and return backwards right, well, again let's just speed this up so that we lose our visibility on these it's now now that we've gained a visual confirmation that this is a light cruiser when we move our ship and we lose visual it's still going to now show up as a voxel so um no matter what you do now once you've visually identified something it'll then uh, the deception's broken you know where that track is it's 5589 now, if you do lose, uh, now something I haven't tested, but I have a theory on is that you can lose uh, tracks. Track numbers can change. If you do lose um, the track on the screen completely, and then it moves, I think uh, it was two, two and a half kilometers from the last position it was uh, identified at without being re-identified, you'll get a new track number, which may actually reincorporate uh, the voxel, uh, or that may reincorporate the deceptive module. So let's just have a quick test of that. So I'm going to send this one all the way back here and back. And let's see the results. So here you can see uh, now that we've uh, lost radar range, so I did actually have to turn my radars off because I think I have uh, something fairly far out. Uh, it had 5589 as a track. It's now come in back as 7251, noting that there's still only two ships. It's now reactivated the deception module back to Corvette. If we were to drive forward again, uh, we would then identify this once, uh, once again as the light cruiser. So again, let's just do that just to verify. Receiving. So again, light cruiser, sprinter. And now they're both light cruisers. So if you do uh, manage to slip away from, from the enemy for a while, from detection range, you will be able to uh, reactivate those deception modules, giving them a little bit of uh, further utility later in the game. So a new stat has been added to two hulls, um, the Axford and to the Solomon. So you'll see this is now max repair, uh, which is a plus 15% uh, modifier onto the Axford and a plus 5% modifier onto the Solomon. So the aim is here to make them a little bit tougher by allowing them to repair further up than the base game previously allowed. So what occurs is when you take damage, 
um, you used to be only able to repair up from 10% um, based on wherever you started repairing at. So if you had a component with 50% um, health left and then a repair team got to it, you'd be able to repair up to 60%. Now what this effectively does, it allows the Axford to take that base 10% and another 15. So same scenario, components down at 50%. You then have max repair up to uh, 25%, so it'll be able to repair up to 75%, which means for um, an Axford, if it comes anything sort of above 75%, it'll always be able to go back to 100. However, uh, it, once it does start to fall below 75, you can obviously only repair up to 25% each time um, until such time that you run out of repair teams or you simply take so much damage that your repair teams can't keep up. Now Solomon, uh, that only has 5%, so it'll get the base 10% and then a 5% as well. So it'll have a ability to repair up to a max repair of 15% overall. Just note that in the actual patch notes, it says the Axford's 20. Um, the patch notes are wrong. The game's obviously right. It's uh, 15%. Now overall, the um, Nebula Select command caps this at 50%. You can't achieve this in the base game, but it does allow modders to reach up to that 50% um, if they want to implement other modules. Uh, to provide you know different functionality so just something for the modders there just uh, also just one thing that i mentioned that you can now see this stat down in damage control so you can see max repair is at 25 percent uh, so it's 10 percent plus the 15 if we add in a sprinter we add in a sprinter you can see that the max repair is 10 percent so um, maybe that should potentially be there based on the fact that uh, it's just a whole modifier but you have to put something in there to be able to see it so whilst we're also here, the Solomon has had its armor thickness increased. So from 52, uh, now up to 58 centimeters. So again, uh, just trying to address the fact that um, the, heavy, the heavy ships or the capital ships were dying a little bit too quickly. Um, you know, obviously there's player skill always involved in composition and build and stuff like that. But it, it does make it just a little bit more tankier now with the ability to repair a little bit more and uh, a few extra centimeters of armor. Just a few small balance changes. So... Um, all of the uh, Alliance guns, so Mark 68, Mark 66, Mark 65, have, have had both a health points and a damage threshold increase. So you can read that in the patch notes, or I'll put that on the screen. Um, the Mark 66 has gone from 350 up to 550. Um, you've had the Mark 68 go from 450 to 650. And then you've also got the Mark 65, which has gone from 325 up to 450. And then they've all had the damage threshold of 30 up to 40. So um, you're going to be able to now not only have the capitals a little bit uh, more tankier just as a whole, but their main armaments are also going to be a little bit stronger so they don't just get shot off uh, pretty quickly. Uh, a little bit more health obviously makes them last longer, but the damage threshold by an extra 10 means that you're going to need um, that final hit to change a component from red to gray to effectively knock it out. Um, needs to be above 40. So the Bastion has taken a bit of a nerf that used to fire at four rounds per second and now fires at three rounds per second. So Flak uh, has been degraded a little bit uh, on the OSP side. Over to missiles, uh, a few different things. So first of all, uh, over on the mace, uh, there's quite a few different changes, but ultimately it'll now, uh, and I won't go through all of them because some of them I don't fully understand, but effectively the speed of a torpedo has now been increased um, to 175 to 300 meters per second. So, and that's up from um, 125 to 200 that it previously was. And it's able to turn a little bit quicker. It's also had its programming time halved from six seconds to three seconds. And it's had its HP go up from 110 to 160. So effectively, if I was to summarize it for you, you've got a tankier, faster, and you're able to fire more of them, uh, size three torpedo than you previously did. So if we were to have a look at support module changes, both the size two and the size three missiles now allow you to put um, support modules into the body of the missile. So you don't only just have to have offensive uh, size twos, you can actually have uh, size twos that are simply decoy launchers or cluster decoy launchers or jammers, uh, which have all had a bit of a change. Um, in the pylum in particular, you can put a decoy launcher. You can also then add in something um, such as a self-screening jammer and then have it also be directed and cruise guided. So um, you can effectively build, now this is quite expensive and I don't think you would actually maybe do it, but you can have a, you can have a fairly configurable uh, size two or size three missile now. Whilst we're here, um, if you do select a decoy launcher or a cluster decoy launcher, 
Uh, each of these ticks here, so going from one means you'll have either three decoys or six, depending on which one you select. Then each tick will then uh, give you another set of decoys. So here, if we're on a size seven, then you're going to get 21 decoys being able to be fired from this pylon. So you do pay for it. Um, however, you do get the benefits of it. So the self screening jammer has had a boost. Its power has gone up. Its radius has also gone up. Well, this is the one that provides a radar jamming bubble around it. Great to protect your other missiles. And the boosted self screening jammer has also had a buff uh, quite significantly, actually. Um, so this is the one that produces a cone out to the front of the missile. So its uh, radiated power has gone up significantly um, from 0 0.5 to 5. Its range um, of jamming has increased by a kilometer from 4 to 5, and its field of view has doubled from 10 to 20. Um, this one now also will um, be able to rotate the self-screening jammer 30 degrees onto a target. So um, as you are flying towards an enemy, this self-screening jam is going to be able to flick onto that target and start jamming uh, before the actual rest of the missile body has rotated around to start to engage it. Now, I haven't been able to replicate that too often, so that's why I'm not showing it. However, it is uh, something that I think between these two and the way that we now have um, the mixed missile salvos uh, feature being introduced, you may actually see a lot more of them as they are as they can be used to now cover the approaches of other missiles. Uh, as they come towards the target, throwing off the radar guided AMMs, as well as throwing off the um, PD of a particular ship as it closes. So one thing that has changed, which makes them a lot better, is the fact that they now activate their jamming the moment they get out of the ship, um, or the launch ship, I should say, whereas previously what they did was they activated as they got through that last waypoint, which meant most of the time they were in flight, they didn't really do anything for you, whereas now they're actually providing utility the whole way along. Um, and I think you'll probably see a lot more of these, which means that you actually see the old repost with, uh, which is command guided, actually making a return because it's not going to be comms uh, as it won't be a radar jammed. Uh, obviously, comms jamming will still throw these off, but I don't think that's very prevalent within games. All right, that's it from me. I hope um, you enjoyed this update. I hope it gives you a, a number of different options to play with and brings a little bit of uh, freshness to the game. Uh, it's good to see that the minor updates continue and I believe the Conquest update is still progressing. Um, so hopefully we get to see more of that in a, in a future devlog. But um, thank you for watching and take care.